Good morning. Today we are going to review current, resistance, and simple circuits for AP Physics C, Electricity and Magnetism. Flippin' Physics! Billy, tell me about electric current. Absolutely! The symbol for electric current is capital I. Current is defined as the derivative of charge with respect to time. It has units of coulombs per second, which are called amperes, and the symbol for amps is capital A. Amperes are a base SI unit. Uh, I guess I should point out that this is instantaneous electric current. Average current is the change in charge over change in time. Uh, the basic idea behind current uh, is that at a specific point, it is the total electric charge of the charges which pass by that point in a current carrying wire divided by the time it takes for those electric charges to pass by that point. Uh, electric current occurs when there is an electric potential difference across a wire. That means if there is zero electric potential difference, uh, current does not flow, and... Uh, Conventional current. Oh, yeah. Uh, unless we are told differently, electric current in this class is considered to be conventional current. The direction of conventional current is the direction positive charges would flow. The reality is that in most circuits, negative charge carriers, usually electrons, move opposite the direction of conventional current. We need to remember that electrons are what are really moving in a current carrying wire, and that those electrons are moving opposite the direction of conventional current. Very nice, Billy. Now let's take a look at a figure showing charges flowing in a wire. You can see we have modeled this with positive charges which have a velocity to the right in the wire, and that is the direction of the conventional current in this wire. Let's use the equation for average current. Over a change in time, a very large number of charge carriers pass by a point. Delta Q is the total amount of charge which passes by during that change in time. Therefore, delta capital Q equals the number of charge carriers which pass by a point during a change in time, multiplied by the charge per carrier, little q. In order to determine the number of charge carriers, we need to use charge carrier density, whose symbol is lowercase n. Charge carrier density equals the number of charge carriers per unit volume. That means the number of charge carriers equals charge carrier density times volume. And that means delta Q equals charge carrier density times volume times charge per carrier. This brings us to the concept of drift velocity, V sub D. Drift velocity is the average velocity of the charge carriers in a current carrying wire. The reality is that the charge carriers in the wire are always moving around in the wire, even when there is no current in the wire. It's just that when there is no current in a wire, the average velocity of the charge carriers is zero. The addition of an electric potential difference across a wire changes the average velocity of the charge carriers from zero to a small value in the direction of the current in the wire. In most wires, the drift velocity of the charge carriers typically is quite low, something like one-tenth of a millimeter per second. The reason a light bulb in a circuit, for example, turns on immediately when you flip the switch is because all the electrons are already in the wires. When you flip the switch, all the charge carriers start flowing. All right, back to the illustration of current and the equations. The volume of the charge carriers which passes by a point in a time period equals the cross-sectional area of the wire times the displacement delta x that means we now know the charge of the charge carriers which passes by a point over a time period equals charge carrier density times cross-sectional area times displacement times charge per carrier. Going back to the drift velocity equation, you can see the displacement of the charge carriers equals drift velocity times change in time, which we can substitute back into our delta Q equation. And going back to our average current equation, we can substitute our equation for delta Q into that equation. Notice, change in time cancels out, and we are left with the current in a wire equals charge carrier density times cross-sectional area times drift velocity times charge per carrier. That was a lot. Oh, yeah. Sure, but we, we have a lot to go. Great. Sure. Okay. All right. Uh, you know what? Actually, I've talked quite a lot. Bo, tell me what you remember about current density. Sure. 
Current density equals current over cross-sectional area. And what is the symbol for current density? Uh, I don't. It's uppercase J. Right. And we can substitute the equation you just derived for electric current into the equation. Cross-sectional area cancels out. And we get that current density equals N. Charge carrier density. Charge carrier density times drift velocity times Q. Charge per carrier. Yeah. We also know current density equals conductivity times electric field. The symbol for conductivity is a lowercase sigma, and conductivity is a measure of how little a material opposes the movement of electric charges. And conductivity is a fundamental property of a material. But... That equation does not work, does not actually work for all conductors, right? I mean, some conductors are non-ohmic. Yeah, uh, current density equals conductivity times electric field is one version of Ohm's law, and conductors which follow Ohm's law are called ohmic. Conductors which do not follow Ohm's law are called non-ohmic. Very nice, y'all. Realize an electric potential difference across a wire is what causes current in the wire, and we are assuming the electric field created in the wire is uniform. That means the magnitude of the electric potential difference across a wire equals the electric field times d, a distance parallel to the electric field. We derived that equation in a previous lesson. However, rather than using d for the distance in the electric field, we will be using capital L for the length of the wire. That means the electric field in the wire equals the electric potential difference across the wire divided by the length of the wire. We can substitute that in for the electric field in the current density equation, and when we solve for electric potential difference, it equals current density in the wire times the length of the wire divided by the conductivity of the wire material. We can substitute current over wire cross-sectional area in for current density and solve for the electric potential difference across the wire. Notice that parenthetically in the electric potential difference equation, we have wire length over the quantity conductivity times cross-sectional area. This is defined as the resistance of the wire. The symbol for resistance is capital R. I will point out that typically resistance is defined in terms of resistivity, lowercase rho, rather than conductivity. Resistivity is a measure of how strongly a material opposes the movement of charges. This makes resistivity the inverse of conductivity. And just like conductivity, resistivity is a fundamental property of a material. In other words, the resistance of a wire equals the resistivity of the wire material times the length of the wire divided by the cross-sectional area of the wire. Realize this equation for the resistance of a wire requires that the wire have uniform geometry. In other words, the cross-sectional area needs to be constant over the entire length of the wire. And now that we have resistivity, Ohm's law is often given in terms of resistivity instead of conductivity. That means electric field equals resistivity times current density. And that brings us to the more common form of Ohm's law. Bobby, what is the form of Ohm's law which you are more used to working with? Well, we know we can replace the parenthetical expression with conductivity in it to the one with resistivity instead, and we get electric potential difference equals current times resistance. Yeah, yeah, that, that is the equation for Ohm's law which I am more familiar with, and I will point out Again, that not all materials are ohmic. Only objects made from materials which follow Ohm's law, this law, are ohmic. And we can solve that equation for resistance to show that resistance has units of volts over amperes, which we call ohms, for which the symbol is uppercase omega. The unlucky horseshoe. Unlucky because it is upside down. Well, what are the units for resistivity? We can rearrange the resistance equation to get resistivity equals resistance times cross-sectional area over length. The units for that are ohms times square meters over meters, which are just ohm meters. The units for resistivity are ohm meters. I've never really understood the difference between resistance and resistivity. I mean, 
Resistance, resistivity, resistance, resistivity. They they really sound the same to me. Okay. Well, resistance has units of ohms, and resistivity has units of ohm meters, so they clearly are not the same. Resistance is a property of an object. Resistivity is a property of a material. Sure. I, I think I get it. One specific resistor has a specific resistance. However, many different resistors made out of the same material will all have the same resistivity. Exactly, because resistance is a property of an object, and resistivity is a material property. Two objects can have the same resistivity, but different resistances if they are made of the same material. However, they have different lengths or cross-sectional areas. Yeah. Yep. Thanks, everybody. Now, please realize the resistivity of a conducting material typically decreases with temperature. To remember this, consider what we know about superconductors. Superconducting materials have zero resistivity and require very, very low temperatures. So clearly, resistivity decreases with decreasing temperature. In this class, unless otherwise stated, the resistivity of conducting materials is considered to be constant regardless of temperature. And remember that resistors usually convert electric potential energy to thermal energy, which can increase the temperature of the resistor and can increase the temperature of the resistor's environment. All right, now let's talk about electric power. Remember that power equals the derivative of potential energy with respect to time. Billy, please begin with that equation and derive an equation for electric power. Absolutely, that means Electric power equals the derivative of electric potential energy with respect to time. We know electric potential energy equals charge times electric potential difference. Mr. P, may we assume the electric potential difference is constant? Yes, Billy. Let's assume the electric potential difference of our circuit element is constant. Great. That means electric power equals the derivative of charge with respect to time times electric potential difference. And the derivative of charge with respect to time is electric current. That means the rate at which a circuit element converts electric potential energy to heat, light, and sound equals the current through the, elect to the, through the circuit element multiplied by the electric potential difference uh, across the circuit element. Yes, Billy, that is correct. Bobby, please use the more common version of Ohm's law to derive another expression for electric power. Okay, uh... Ohm's law says electric potential difference equals current times resistance. We can substitute that into the expression for electric power Billy derived, and we get that electric power also equals the square of the electric current through a resistor times the resistance of the resistor. Thank you, Bobby. Bo, there is one more expression for electric power. Please derive that. Sure. From Ohm's law, we know current equals electric potential difference over resistance. Substitute that into Bobby's equation, and we get that electric power equals the square of electric potential difference over resistance. Yes, thank you, Bo. We just used Ohm's law to prove electric power equals current times electric potential difference, current squared times resistance, and electric potential difference squared over resistance. Now, let's look at a unit which is often used when it comes to electricity, the kilowatt hour. Bo, please work with the units of one kilowatt hour to see if you can ferret out what a kilowatt hour actually is. Ferret? What does a domesticated polecat kept as a pet or used for catching rabbits have to do with kilowatt hours? He said to ferret out what a kilowatt hour actually is. It just means to search tenaciously for something. He likes to use weird words like that sometimes. So do I. Of, of course, course you, you do. do. Jinx, you'll, you'll be a soda. Ah. Uh, okay. <laughs> one kilowatt hour. Bo, please? Sure. One kilowatt hour. We know one watt equals 1,000 kilowatts. Now we have 1,000 watt hours. A watt is a joule per second. Joule hours per second is just weird. So... We know 3,600 seconds is the same as one hour. 
That means one kilowatt hour is the same as 3.6 megajoules? Really? Yep. The kilowatt hour is another misnomer, an inaccurate name or designation. Kilowatt hour sounds like it is a unit of power. However, it is actually a unit of energy. Words. Yeah. But is it really a misnomer? I mean, it does say kilowatt hour, so it clearly is not just a unit of power. It's pretty pretty clear something else is going on. Huh. I, I think we tend to just hear the kilowatt and immediately think it has to do with power. Okay, that makes sense. I guess none of the terms in kilowatt hour initially seem to have anything to do with energy. Except that watts are joules per second. Yeah, maybe not a misnomer. Perhaps kilowatt hour is just misleading. Yeah, maybe. All right, so a light bulb is a common item used in physics. A light bulb can be treated as a resistor, which converts electric potential energy to light, heat, and sound energy. And the brightness of a light bulb increases with increasing power and decreases with decreasing power. Therefore, the brightness of a light bulb is often used to demonstrate the power in electric circuits. Speaking of electric circuits, let's discuss the basics of electric circuits. An electric circuit is typically composed of electrical loops, which can include items such as wires, batteries, resistors, light bulbs, capacitors, switches, ammeters, voltmeters, and inductors. Each of those circuit elements is typically illustrated using the symbols I am showing here. I'm not going to talk about each individual circuit element right now. We will get to we will get plenty of opportunities to talk about all of these over the course of the next few lessons. What is an inductor? No idea. I'm sure he'll talk about it eventually. Okay. Let's look at a simple circuit with a battery and a resistor connected by wires. The long line of the battery is the positive terminal of the battery, and the short line is the negative terminal. Next to the battery, I'm going to place a lowercase Greek letter epsilon. Epsilon is the symbol for electromotive force, which is often called the EMF of the battery. The, ele the electromotive force, or EMF, of a battery is the ideal electric potential difference, or voltage, across the terminals of the battery. Hold up. I thought lowercase epsilon was the symbol for electric permittivity. It is. Lowercase epsilon is the symbol for both EMF and electric permittivity. Ugh. Uh... So, electromotive force is not a force, it is an electric potential difference? I guess electromotive force is another misnomer. Yeah. 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 <laughs> According to the law of charges, positive charges are repelled from the positive terminal of the battery and attracted to the negative terminal. Therefore, the electric current in the circuit is clockwise. I've illustrated that with an arrow indicating that the electric current goes down through the resistor in our circuit. Okay, I am now going to compare the energies of a single charge moving through the circuit to the mechanical energies of a mass. Realize there are many, many more charges than just this one charge moving through the circuit. However, right now we are just looking at the energies of that single charge. And let's make the battery a three cell battery. So the length of the battery in the circuit diagram is roughly the same as the length of the resistor. Billy, please compare the energies of the mass to those of the electric charge being shown here. Absolutely. As the charge moves up through the battery, the charge gains electric potential energy, just like the mass gains gravitational potential energy as you lift it. As the charge moves along the top of the wire, its electric potential energy stays constant, just like the mechanical energy of the mass stays constant as it sits at the top of the wall. As the charge moves down through the resistor, the electric potential energy of the charge is converted to heat energy, just like the gravitational potential energy of the mass is converted to kinetic energy. And then as the charge moves along the bottom wire, its electric potential energy again stays constant, just like, again, the mechanical energy of the mass stays constant as it sits on the ground. And then the whole process is repeated. But what about the resistance of the wires? We we just derived the resistance of wires. Shouldn't the resistance of the wires affect what happens here? Oh, right. 
sorry, unless otherwise stated, all wires are considered to be ideal wires and have zero resistance. As charges move along a wire with zero resistance, the charge will experience zero change in electric potential energy. That is what is happening in the wires at the top and bottom of the circuit and is analogous to the mass at rest at a constant height at either the top or bottom of the wall. Now, I do want to take a few moments to look at a color-coded demonstration of what we just talked about for the electric potential energy of electric charges moving through this circuit. Notice I am now illustrating many more of the electric charges moving through the circuit. You can see, you know, actually, Bo, tell me what you see. Sure. Looks like you have chosen the color blue to illustrate the minimum electric potential energy of the charges and red to illustrate the maximum electric potential energy of the charges. And this is pretty much what Billy just said. As charges move through the battery, they go from blue to red because they gain electric potential energy. As charges move along the top and bottom wires, the charges maintain a constant color because they maintain a constant electric potential energy because the wires are ideal and have negligible resistance. As charges move through the resistor, their color goes from red to blue because their electric potential energy is being converted to heat. And if this resistor were a light bulb instead, it would also be converting the electric potential energy to, of the charges to heat, light, and sound energy. That's it. That's all I see. Thank you, Bo. Notice this means the positive side of the resistor is at the top of the resistor in our diagram, and the negative side of the, of the resistor is at the bottom of the resistor in our diagram. This is because the charge has its highest electric potential energy at the top, therefore the electric potential of the resistor is highest at the top. And the charge has its lowest electric potential energy at the bottom, and therefore the electric potential of the resistor is lowest at the bottom. Notice, this means the electric potential across the resistor goes down in the direction of the current, just like the electric charges moving through the resistor experience a decrease in their electric potential energy. Electric potential across a resistor decreases in the direction of current, so the electric potential difference in the direction of current across a resistor is negative. Got it. Next, let's talk about terminal voltage. Terminal voltage Delta V sub T is the measured voltage across the terminals of the battery. Oh, oh, that is different from the electromotive force because EMF is the ideal electric potential difference across a battery. Correct, Billy. All real batteries have some internal resistance such that when a battery is supplying current to a circuit, the voltage measure, measured across the terminals of the battery, the terminal voltage, is less than the EMF of the battery. Typically, the symbol for the internal resistance of a battery is a lowercase r, and one way to illustrate a real battery in a circuit is by combining an EMF with a resistor and putting a box around that combination. In this circuit, the real battery is highlighted in yellow. The terminal voltage across the battery equals the EMF of the battery minus the electric potential difference across the internal resistance of the battery. We subtract the electric potential difference across the internal resistance of the battery because electric potential difference goes down in the direction of the current. We already showed that electric potential difference equals current times resistance. Therefore, the terminal voltage across a battery equals the EMF of the battery minus current through the battery times the internal resistance of the battery. Notice this means that as the current through a battery increases, the terminal voltage across the battery decreases. And the only way to get terminal voltage to equal EMF is to have zero current flowing through a battery. That does okay. not really make sense. Sure. I agree. And that concludes my review of current, resistance, and simple circuits for AP Physics C, Electricity, and Magnetism. Next time, we are going to review series and parallel circuits. Thank you very much for learning with me today. I enjoyed learning with you.